this God that we serve is really incredible. Because I've been buried under so much rubble and fable and tradition, you can't find me. And he says, if you're going to find me, you're going to have to search. Or maybe we don't have our eyes open. is something that we do because we're so grateful for what he does. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save someone like me I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Hi, my name is Drew and you're watching a His Truth Seekers Ministry Bible presentation. Uh, this presentation will be the uh, study on the Day of Atonement. Joining me is Tom, but uh, just before we begin, the day we're recording this is the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so we've been actually separated from our work, from our hustle and bustle, uh, from traffic for the past eight days. So I'm telling you this just because, um, you know, when we do these videos so you can see what, um, you know, the way Tom discusses these points that he's uh, presenting, you don't often um, get a sense for uh, just, there's, there's more you, you get from a discussion than necessarily from uh, just a presenter. But we're a bit biased because we've actually been away for eight days now, so our connection with reality is slightly skewed. So. We're going to begin this video, uh, and as Tom speaks, um, I've got some questions here because I know what's in the video. I'm going to ask Tom these questions, and we're going to talk a little bit about the information. So you go ahead, and the video is going to start for you here momentarily, and then we'll be cutting in, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to Tom. Okay? So uh, God bless, and uh, enjoy the video. Okay, so let's bow our heads here and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. Father, we thank you especially for your mercy that you have extended to each one of us. You have extended that mercy so that we can live above this world in a lot of different ways. Live above the wickedness, live above the wickedness in our own mind, the patterns that we've developed over the course of our lifetimes, some of us worse than others, of course, but it really doesn't matter. Sin is sin, and even one sin will keep us out of your kingdom. And it's not that you want to keep us out of your kingdom just because we have one sin. It's just that your kingdom wouldn't be safe with sinners in it. And you've told us that sin will not rise up a second time, and we take your word for that. And, and in understanding that, we've battled with sin in our own lives over and over again, and, and we recognize, Father, that we are not ready for your kingdom. And we are asking you to do something, do a major renovation on our hearts. Even as we celebrate this time, this 
recognition that there was a Holy Spirit that was poured out on men. And that was only a shadow of what's to come here, Father. We recognize that and we want to celebrate that time this weekend because we're looking forward to that final outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will give us that steadfastness that we need. Father, in your word, in, in Ezekiel 36, you've told us that you will put a new spirit in our hearts that will cause us to walk in your statutes and judgments and do them. We claim that promise. We claim the promise of your spirit to do that work in us that we cannot do ourselves. Father, as we get to know you better, as we get to study your festivals, they teach us this whole plan of salvation and how you're going to wrap this thing up, and that's what we're studying this weekend. We want to know how it's all going to happen. As we study here today, we ask that you give us fresh insights, open our minds and hearts, cleanse our hearts so that your spirit can truly work in and through us. Give us that understanding that we need, Father, we pray. In the name of your Son who died for us so that we could walk upright. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 Welcome, everyone. Can everyone see that from there? You guys got binoculars back there? Okay. Let's just move this one back. Okay. So, we're going to talk about the Day of Atonement. Well, we can't really talk about the Day of Atonement unless... You guys are all linear thinkers, right? Think along a line. You know, we can start at a point, we go and we meet certain points. That's not very straight, is it? Okay, that's fine. So, somewhere in history, according to the Word, it says that Adam and Eve were made, right? Everyone's familiar with that. Well, that's not the beginning. There was time before that, right? But we don't know much about that. There's glimpses in the Bible about what happened back there. But we know one thing for sure happened back there. There was this guy that decided to, um, well, he decided he was smart enough to do his own thing. And he started to put himself on a pedestal, and he said, you know what, talking to all his buddies, you guys really don't need to listen to him. You can do it my way. The old Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. And he's going to be able to sing at the end of this whole thing, down at the end, and he's going to be able to sing in front of everyone, I did it my way. <laughs> How many people are going to do that, sing that song? The word says, many, many because they wouldn't do it God's way. See, that's really what it's all about, is a guy started on a path here, and he wasn't going to do it God's way. In fact, it's exactly the same thing that we have today when you think about it. You know, we have this idea that we have the Holy Spirit, and it's setting us in a direction, and somehow, some people don't understand that the Holy Spirit is actually going to be our guide right through to eternity. Do you know that? but not through to eternity, through eternity. You see, these guys back here had the Holy Spirit too. It was God's voice. Everything they did told them what to do. Didn't tell them what to do per se, but led them and guided them to be happy. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's for? It's to guide us, right? into a right place so that we can have happy lives. Isn't that what the idea is? If the Holy Spirit's given to those who obey him, the purpose of obeying him is not, so God's not saying that you've got to do what I want you to do. Every regulation that he has made is for our benefit and for our happiness. Do you know what, he doesn't really do anything for himself. He does everything for his created beings, everything. That's why in Revelation you see over and over, worthy, worthy is this guy. They know everything he does is for everyone else. All this worship and praise that people give him is just because of who he is, because he's like that. Have you ever had anyone praise you? Have you ever had anyone praise you for something good that you've done? Come on. Sure you have, sure you have. 
That's why we see in Revelation and all over the Bibles all this praise to God. It's not that he's demanding it. They give it freely because of who he is. He's so good and we don't, we don't understand that. It's so clouded. It says in the word in Jeremiah, it says, if you will search for me with all of your heart. Now the idea being is, why does he make himself so invisible on this planet? Why has he? It's because of what happened back here. This guy, this Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call him, the old dragon, has done his work here, and he is actually the king of this world. Do you guys know that? He's, the prince, he's called the prince of this world in the word. He's been given, actually, he's been given authority over this world right now. It's been given into his hands. Do you, do you understand that? Someone up there has actually stepped off his throne and said, if you think you can do it any better than I can, fill your boots. Do you realize that? That happened. And he showed up in the garden. He showed up in the garden. And they invited him in. Now, we were talking a little bit earlier. When you listen to the enemy and you actually do start doing what he tells you to do, you've just invited him in. You're looking for trouble. You're absolutely looking for trouble. Well, we know the story on that. We don't want to spend too much on uh, time on that. But we know as things went on, actually, 4,000 years later, what happened? Somebody died, right? The guy that stepped off the throne gave his life to win all these people back. But not only that, he did that for these guys too. Do you know that? He did that for them too. He's done it from eternity. You see, his sacrifice actually covers way back since there was one created all the way through. We will never forget his sacrifice that he's made for us through eternity. We will always know about it. So we have this here, but what was this? Somebody tell me, what was this? Pardon me? Passover. You see, God's on a timetable. That's what we don't understand. He's on a timetable. It says in the word, when the fullness of time had come. That's this. That's a clock. He's on a clock. God knows no haste or delay. He knows the exact moment that he's got to show up. And he knows the exact moment that he's got to show up in your life. Have you been struggling with anything in your life, in the, you know, in the past, or you know you're going to have struggles? He's not going to show up until the right time. Show up today. How many times do we show up today? 4,000 years. You know what Eve said? The Lord has given me a son. The Messiah. That's what she thought. 4,000 years later, he comes. He comes. What's going on here? This timetable is taking way longer than we want, right? So how long has it been to now? Let's just say, can we say 2,000 years later? Another 2,000 years? Which gives us about 6,000 years. Okay? And we're waiting for something else. So if this whole thing is a timetable, if the festivals are timetables, and this is what we can see clearly, is there another part of the puzzle that we're looking at? Now when we look at the festal calendar, we see in the spring is the Feast of Passover. What happened on the Feast of Passover? The lamb died. But before that, uh, four days before that, there was a lamb that was selected. And that was the lamb that you chose to sacrifice at the Passover. Then that happened. We know the sequence of events. Then there was the wave sheaf, the resurrection. That's what that symbolized. So we see some things going on here. But we don't see a judgment or a day of atonement. We don't see that. So we're looking at that further on. We see hints of it everywhere in Scripture. And that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to try and define this day of atonement 
to see what exactly it means and when it's going to happen. Now, it's actually going to happen right before the second coming. There's going to be a judgment right before the second coming. So I'm going to call this point second coming. And I'm not saying it's exactly 6,000 years. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So let's just say that. So the judgment is going to happen at the year, uh, or just before the second coming. But, I'm going to shrink this down here. There's another thousand years that go by. Some people refer that to the millennium. It's never called the millennium. It's called the thousand years. And it's recorded six times within six verses of Scripture. So do you think it's important? And some people say, well, John's our only witness. How can we trust him? Well, good question. But if you read the first, book, first few verses of the book of Revelation, it says it went from the Father, then it went to the Son, then it went to the angel, and then it went to John. I got four witnesses right here that say the book of Revelation is from the throne. I don't care what anyone says. People start walking around and say, you can't trust the book of Revelation, you can't trust a certain chapter in the book of Revelation. I'll tell you what, what other pages do you want to rip out of this book? Any others? You either take it the way it is or you just get rid of it. Why bother? Who knows what you can take out of this? If there's something that isn't gelling up here, if you can't bring some harmony with verses in here, in your own mind, the problem's up here, not in here. Now that's not to say that somebody one day couldn't come to you and say, you know what, I had a vision last night. So what do you do? You put on your best running shoes and you run as fast as you can, right? I'll tell you what, don't do that, listen. Listen. They might have something to say because this book says that there will be visions in the last days. Dreams, prophesying. You may be shutting off an avenue that God's trying to reach you if you do that. So don't do that, it would behoove us to listen. But take it back to the word. Always take it back to the word, it's gotta square with it. If it doesn't, you know right away, it's not right, right? Okay, so let's, uh, so we got a millennium. We also have another judgment that's right on the heels. This judgment is the Day of Atonement. This judgment is the Day of Atonement. Oh, well, God has appointed a day and an hour, right? One day and an hour. I'm telling you there's two, right? Isn't that what I'm telling you? So it can't be right. Well, you're going to have to stay with me for the presentation, and you're going to see it crystal clear. There's two. Everyone knows about the great white throne judgment, right, at the end? That's the Day of Atonement, right there. Right there. No question about it. This one here is the judgment in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at that. That's when thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands stood before him and the books were opened. The judgment was set. That's the Day of Atonement. Are you saying specific day? Okay, yeah, I should have said something. We're going to hold questions because there's no way I'm going to get through the material. Please write your questions down. We will have ample time for questions if you hang around, okay? Um, but yeah, I can't start asking questions. I just want to get you the information. It's all going to, yes, it's all going to be recorded. And, I, and I, I'm not sure if this is the answer to your question, but uh, this is, this starts on the Day of Atonement, this judgment. This one does too. Exact days, no question. What day did he die on? What? Minute did he die on? He was, it says that he was crucified in the book of John. It says he was crucified at the third hour of the day. That's when he was, he was crucified at the third hour of the day. And in the reckoning, in biblical reckoning in time, that's the nine o'clock hour. Okay, that nine o'clock hour is the same time that the sacrificial lamb every day was sacrificed. So
So why would Mark happen to record that in the Bible? I wonder why. Because we needed to know for sure that he was the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world, right? He had to die on time or he's not the guy. He's not the guy. We've got to look for somebody else. So Mark happens to mention that he, he was nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock. And then it says he gave up his ghost at the ninth hour, which is the 3 o'clock hour in the afternoon, which is the time of the evening sacrifice. We not only know that he's the Passover lamb, but he's our morning and evening too. It's so clear in Scripture. You know, when you say, well, do I need to know this? Is it salvation? Well, my name is Thomas. And I don't know, are you familiar with that name at all? Familiar with me, maybe. My name is Thomas, and my mother, every once in a while, she would say, oh, doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, you know. Well, that got into my brain. It's like it's in concrete in my brain. So I doubted everything. So is it a salvation issue for me? Yes, it is a salvation issue for me. Because I'm like the guy that says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because I don't know about you, but I'm plagued with doubts all the time. Could this be true? Are you sure you're hearing this right? Has anyone been there? Are you sure that you think you heard the Holy Spirit? Is this really what the Holy Spirit sounds like? Is there a Holy Spirit? You know, I don't know about you, but I was raised in, a, in an educational system that... Uh, yeah, we might have had prayer outside at the flagpole and, and had the Lord's Prayer, but during class, that was it, and we were taught evolu evolution from the time I was all the way up. I've been plagued with that forever. Absolutely. That stuff doesn't go away. And you just, you sure? You sure? Are you sure? Are you sure this word is right? So God said, and I accepted that promise 25 years ago, he said, if you will search for me with all your heart, you'll find me. And I took him up on that. And I've been searching for with, with all my heart for 30 years for this God that has made himself so invisible. But he hasn't made himself invisible. It's someone else that has made himself invisible because he set up his ways on this planet and you just can't find the God of this Universe, you can't find him. But if you go walk in nature, you can find him. He's everywhere in nature. But primarily, he's found in the Word. And if people aren't studying the Word, I have no idea how they find God. I have no idea. I really don't know. But I know for sure, the more I study this Word, the more solid. My unbelief is fading. It's disappearing because this book is no accident. When I study this calendar, when I study this word, I see that 40 authors that lived in different times spread out 1,500 years apart, there is absolutely no way they could have put this thing together. When you see the thread, the common thread that goes through here, there's no way. Those people never even knew each other. Didn't even, a lot of them didn't even know each other. They had no idea. And then the more incredible, they didn't even know the story. You get that? These Bible writers, they didn't even know the story. They each had a, a couple pages here. They had a couple pages here, a couple pages here, and a few pages here. And then somebody decided, you know what? These are inspired writers. We need to gather all that information together. And amazingly enough, they're all in harmony with each other. <laughs> Do you get that? There's no way if you were given a chapter to write in a book, somebody could tell you, you know what, this is the end of the story, these are the details I want you to write, but that's not what happened. Is God worked on men where they were, and he gave them portions of the story. And it was up to us to go through here, all the people that followed on the heels of those prophets that had writings, it was up to us to read all those bits of information and assimilate it and put it together and build a picture. And as we get close to the end, it's going to be really important that we have all the information. Now, if I can do this, just give me a moment here. 
Can you see these? Anyone doing any counting? Don't worry about it. Okay. So, this is what happened. This is the way I see it. Adam and Eve sinned. They were given a truth. Has anyone read the first account, the first few chapters of the Bible? Seen what happened? There's a little bit of conversation there. Uh, God tells Adam what he's going to do for him, tells Eve what he's going to do for her, and then tells Satan what he's going to do for Satan. Right? Everyone knows that? That was the only conversation that happened, right? What do you think? That's all God said to Adam? Why don't we have it in here? Why don't we have the rest of the story in here? It is so brief. It is so brief. We needed to fill in the gaps, right? We needed to fill in the gaps. So another prophet comes along, says something there, Add another bit of information, add a little bit more information. Pretty soon we got the book of Job, he's throwing more information in there. And all along we see little glimpses of information. Isaiah a few times talks about a fiery flying serpent. Wow, that's amazing. A fiery flying serpent. Where did he ever get that idea from? You know the anatomy of a serpent? lends itself to this? You want to check it out. Check out the anatomy of the serpent. There's spurs that come out where there would be back legs on a, on a serpent. It's still in some serpents. That's not my point here. My point is, is all the prophets built on what happened before. So you got Adam and Eve connecting a dot. This is the man from the Lord. He's the guy. Okay? You got somebody else. You got Enoch saying that the Lord will come with ten thousands of his saints or holy ones. Has anyone read that? We got to get back to Enoch, seventh from Adam, but we got to go to Jude to, get, to find out what he was preaching about. So all along the way is people had stories to add to the story. God would give them little glimpses. So you got one prophet telling a story and it looks like a triangle. It's all the information he was given. You got another prophet giving a story, connects some of those dots, and now it looks like something else. And we have another prophet over here. And we got all different kinds of shapes. Are you getting the picture? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Is each Bible writer was given a certain amount of information. They wrote it down. They were faithful in it. They wrote it down. But if you take one Bible writer all by himself you will not get the complete picture. It will not be until the end of time that all the dots are going to be connected together. It's not going to happen. So any church that claims they got all the dots connected together, you better figure out where you can find another church. If where you go is declaring that we got it all, you better think again. And you know what? I don't claim that I have it all either. But what I'm trying to do is put all these dots together, and I'm starting to see a picture that no other generation has done. They've never seen it. Because what typically happens, and, and this is the, the process of the Reformation, and we all know this, they go up to a certain point, Ah, I got to get comfortable. This is too hard of work, changing all the time. And then they start a new church because somebody says, you know what, I don't like those guys. They're not interested in truth. They start a new church. And this is the process of the Reformation. 
We can never stop growing in this relationship with our maker. We can't. There's no stopping place until we get to the end. But thank our God, there's this. Our thousand year holiday is coming. And it's coming soon. The trouble is, and this is what I'm trying to get people to be aware of, is there's no getting into eternity without passing through the Day of Atonement first. None. Is it a salvation issue? Absolutely a salvation issue. So we're going to look at this. We're going to get some, into some scripture because I don't want to keep talking because pretty soon it becomes my story and not God's story. So we're going to look at the word here and just see what it says, okay? Sorry to cut you off, but right now we're going to turn to Tom and I'm going to ask him a few questions. Now, Tom, in this subject matter, have you had any special revelation? When you talk about special revelation, just what exactly are you meaning? I mean like, like visions or special revelation, special revelation. Okay, okay, I think I understand your question. Uh, no, there has been no visions. Uh, the only thing that I've been doing and tried to do it as well as I can is just study what the Bible has to say about it. And I'm just bringing forward the things that I'm finding. Okay, I see. So it's, it's just... Bible study, essentially. Yes. And I'm sure you have a Bible study group, or what? Practically, like in your life, what what's your Bible study look like? Just, just I I know it might be a kind of absurd question, but maybe someone wants to know. Yeah, well, a Bible study is something that really everyone should be involved in. And we have a group that meets once a week and we share together and we study things. And, and this has been a point of study that we have, we have done. And basically the Day of Atonement study has been probably about a 30-year study for me. Um, now, we just watched you draw out a timeline. In the beginning of that timeline, there was Adam and Eve on one side and then 6,000 AD, 6,000 years later, sorry, not 6,080, but 6,000 years after Adam and Eve. You said the judgment had to happen somewhere in there. Now, would you, okay, is that considered date setting? Are you date setting? Well, when you start to study the sanctuary service, you see it's two-dimensional. It's one, the articles in the sanctuary, but also it's quite, quite clear that there's a timetable that's involved. Now, when you look at the cycle, it's always in sevens, seven days, seven weeks, uh, and so on. And it goes through, and it goes into years, seven-year cycle, and a 50-year cycle, a 49 plus one cycle in the Jubilee. You can see clearly that God is working on a timetable. So when you roughly calculate the beginning of time being 6,000 years ago as recorded in the Bible, it looks like a real possibility that the 6,000 years is part of a larger cycle of thousands of years. So we're very close to entering the 7,000th year or the seventh day of years, uh, of thousands of years. And it's possible that that is significant because we're com coming up against that number. Okay, so you're, you're giving very general time frames there. So in, in which way um, could it be seen as date setting? Or is date setting, um, I hear the word date setting, and it's used, uh, date setter is, is often a pejorative term for people who um, have set up a time for the return, that sort of thing. Uh, how specific do you get in your date setting? Yeah, and, and I think this, this problem with date setting is people have this idea that we're not going to have a clue when our Savior's going to return. Well, it's clearly as said that we're not supposed to let that hour take us unaware. So somehow we're going to be able to know very close to when he's going to come. And with this cycle in years, uh, it's it's a good idea to keep in mind that he told us that you will know what the end, when the end is here, near. Now, part of the problem is, and the verse that's quoted a lot, is no man knows the day or the hour. And that's true. I don't know right. the day or the hour. Right. You don't know the day and the hour. But in the context of the setting that Yeshua gave that, he was talking to his disciples, and he says, no man knows the day or the hour. 
And it's not even for you to know the time or the season. But he doesn't say at the end of time that no one would ever know the day and the hour. So we have to look at time context when that was given. And, and can we say that no one would ever know the day and the hour? I don't think that that's logical. So do you have anywhere in your Bible studies that you have the day and the hour? Uh, no. Okay, what, is it coming? Well, I have no idea when the day and the hour is. But if we look at the, the system, when we look at God's sanctuary system, there was things like Passover. They should have recognized Yeshua when he came. John the Baptist told them that he was the Lamb of God. Well, what did that mean? They should have understood through the sanctuary that he was coming to die. And the Passover was that event. Just so with the fall festivals, as we've been here celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacles and, and studying the things that are around the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Day of Atonement was just five days before the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Day of Atonement is all about judgment. And so this is the event that's ahead of us. And that's why it's an important study for us, because the judgment is just ahead of us, and we need to know that and understand that. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That seems quite sensible. I don't have to pick up any stones at the moment and throw them <laughs> your way. Um, let me push it and just ask you, when do you think, if ever, do you think that you will know? Will you know first? Will I know first, or will we all will you, know? Will... will, will my okay. When, if I hear about the time and the hour of his coming and say it is true, is it going to be coming from you first, and you're going to present it to a group of people, or or how will that work? I think that, and it's just like anything else. We, as the body of believers, we all work together, and each one of us has different gifts, and. Um, I don't see myself as the one that will announce the day and the hour. It could be anyone. But, but the, basically, the thing that we need to do is keep studying and test everything that we're told by God's word. And uh, if it lines up, it lines up. We, okay. Why are we studying the, um, why are we talking about the Day of Atonement? Well, that's a good question. And, and I just reflected on the Passover. The Jewish people when Yeshua came unto his own and his own received him not, uh, partially it was because they didn't accept who he was, who he claimed to be. And it's very clear that he claimed to be uh, the Messiah. There's no question in that. And some of them people accepted it, but the people in the leadership wouldn't accept it. Did they actually think he was? I have this idea that they thought he was. But however, whatever, whatever it was, they wouldn't accept him. So he came and he went without them accepting him. Now, the Day of Atonement is the same principle. It's now something that's just ahead of us, just like when John the Baptist was announcing the Lamb of God. That was, and we don't want to forget, that was about three and a half years before he actually died. So we can expect people within a certain time frame to be given a specific message about a fulfillment of these festival systems. And I think because of the people are starting to study this, people are starting to preach on it, we should be starting to realize that there could be a reason why God is bringing this truth to the surface. It could be just ahead of us, which I fully believe it is.